KCRW sponsors include A24, presenting Moonlight, a film chronicling three chapters in the life of a young black man, discovering his identity and experiencing first love as he moves from childhood into manhood. In theaters now. From KCRW Santa Monica and KCRW.com, it's The Treatment. I'm Elvis Mitchell. Welcome to The Treatment. So if you know the world of comics, and you should, in 1984, my guest Scott McCloud came up with what I thought was a, a genre-changing comic called Zot, which took the action-adventure superhero genre and really didn't study it on his ear so much as it made it lighter than air. He's used that approach in pretty much everything he's done. He's brought air and, and a sense of breathing to his dissection of comic speed in his books, understanding comics or reinventing comics <laughs> or making comics. He's gone back to making comics himself now after a pretty long interregnum away from the business with his new first graphic novel, a weighty but fun piece of writing called The Sculptor. First of all, Scott, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Elvis. And something I said to you before, and I think it applies even to, to The Sculptor, is that thing you do, even in your, your send-up of beat em down superhero comics destroy, is that sense of one person being completed by another. And I do wonder where that comes from, you, because it's been something that's run through. We go back to Zot and the relationship between Jenny, a forlorn teenage girl who sees literally another world and finds it through Zot. And one of my favorite issues of that is the issue where at one point she's afraid she's imagined the whole thing. That idea of one person completing another, where, where does that come from for you as, as a writer? Yeah, there's always some kind of dichotomy in my stuff. It's true. And in Zot, that first series, it was very much about hope and disillusionment. And I think maybe partially because I was a very hopeful person, a very optimistic person. I started out with a lot of confidence when I was very, very young. I mean, like really like 14, I was determined to make comics, but I also had this weird confidence that it was all going to go well. So like maybe lurking way in the back of my mind was this worry that nah, life doesn't always go that way, you know? <laughs> what are you doing? You're just plunging ahead. So in some ways, maybe I was also playing out some of my fears because I sort of understood that the, that the world wasn't this hopeful place. But I had this personal hopeful narrative for myself. And so maybe in a way I was, I was playing off those two ideas that were debating in my own head. And then later, you know, in, in, in later fiction like, like this latest thing, I guess I was still looking for some kind of dichotomy, some kind of yin and yang. And it's still about hope and disillusionment except this time I'm facing down the final annihilator of hope which is when it all ends, you know, when we die. But seeing if maybe there's some way that hope can exist in a temporary state before that happens. But there's also that, that sort of uh, intersection, too, or that opposition between loneliness and somebody who's incredibly social, who really is a charismatic in the old-fashioned sen sense of the word, somebody who brings other people by sheer force of personality and attracts people through that. Yeah, it's funny because uh, my wife Ivy and I talk about how I'm a learned extrovert, which means that I, my natural state is to be very private and very obsessive, and she's dragged me out. And I've, I've become much more extroverted as a result. So that I guess that dichotomy is also in my own personal life, that idea of, of just, yeah, being sort of being out in the world and being kind of an, an evangelist for the things that I believe in. But, you know, inside it's just... I think a manifestation of, of something that would have been much more private if I didn't have somebody helping me to be out in the world every day. Well, this is a part you're going to tell the audience what the sculptor is about. <laughs> the sculptor, it's a very old idea I had when I was a kid, but it became a lot more rich over the years. And it was just the simple idea of, of a young artist who makes a deal with death and gains this ability, a superpower if you like, I mean it really is, to um, sculpt anything with his bare hands. Um, but the deal is that he's got 200 days to do it before he dies. And once he has this, it doesn't go quite as easily as it might otherwise because he, once all of the external obstacles are gone, internal obstacles start kicking in and he reaches the limits of his own imagination, his own ability to, to understand what he wants. And then along comes the love of his life and <laughs> it turns into a love story. And pretty soon the story becomes... Not about how to use this power, but how to use his days as they're dwindling. You know, what does he do with them? But that's also too uh, cru sort of 
becomes a catalyst for another kind of creativity. He has to come up with a way to win her over. And she appears to him literally as an angel in the streets of New York. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and that, that notion... And I thought that was a really brave thing to do because <laughs> so, many, so many things that you do, and just, again, to, I did a conversation with you last week at the L.A. Public Library, which, as you know, I've been a fan of yours forever. And that, that idea of taking these things that are potentially very corny. At some point, people, even in the, the things you write, comment how potentially corny these things are. Oh, yeah, yeah. But to sort of understand that these, these archetypes have a reason for existing. Well, you know, as a matter of fact, the, the corniness was a big part of this for me because... It was that tension, once again, a tension between the young me and this young sentimental. Because I've always been very, very sentimental and maybe a little irony deficient like my protagonist is. So I have this idea when I'm really young and there's a corny aspect to it. And what I could do as an older person now that I'm trying to tell this story, much, much older, right? Because I began working on this when I was twice the age of the, guy, of the kid who came up with it. I could go in and just annihilate all that. I could take out every part of the story that, that, that felt corny or sentimental. Or I could try to better understand the emotional charge that went into that initial impulse and see if maybe I could try to preserve that vitality and, and channel it through something more meaningful. That's what I tried to do. I didn't want to exterminate the young me. I like that adolescent or just post-adolescent romantic grasping for, for big ideas, for big emotions. I think I think sometimes we we talk ourselves out of it or we let that stuff erode unnecessarily. I think that sometimes we we buy into a conception of adulthood that's joyless, that's without those huge ideas and emotions, and I don't want that kind of adulthood. So so I I was trying to see if there was some way to I don't know, just harness that power. And 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 what I discovered, and this is something that I, during our talk at the library, I compared this to, to Capra and his big piece of cheese, It's a Wonderful Life, is that a lot of that comes in the details. It comes in the way that you fill in those, those big gestures, those plot points, that high concept stuff. And that's what I went for here. So I left those, those big gestures, but I tried to give them context. So much in what you do, that idea that, that the power of love, and I'm I just said it's got that exuberance of pop with the idea right. of being in love with love, that love is a, has a power to open us up. And, you know, I guess and, I still believe that. You know, when you're first in love, you're basically on drugs. Your, your body is manufacturing certain chemicals that, that create a kind of altered state. I like that idea of love as an altered state. I think that's something that's worth evoking in fiction. And I definitely set out to do that. And yeah, it has a poppy quality to it. But and you tell me about the kinds of things you listened to as you were writing. Yeah, <laughs> as you were writing the sculpture. Can I admit this on the record? I'm sure you can. Yeah. Now there, there might have been some Coldplay in there. Um, I, I really, <laughs> I really liked uh, uh, Ray LaMontagne's song "Be Here Now." To me, was like like kind of summed it up. It definitely had that rainy day, minor key things. Not all, not all of my choices were were. Um, something to be embarrassed about. I mean, there was a lot of Radiohead in there too. There was a lot of, you know, weird 1920s electronic music as well, and a lot of instrumental stuff when I was when I was working on things like dialogue. But yeah, I was trying to evoke those emotional states. What's funny though is I turned off all the music as soon as it was, it was time to edit. Really? Why? Yeah, because editing is you have to basically conjure a different part of your brain when you're doing editing. I would go for long walks when I was first plotting the thing and, and just just soak in music. But then when I was trying to figure out how to fix scenes, it had to be complete silence because you have to be very analytical and you have to turn off all sentiment at that point and just, and just evaluate the scenes for how they need to be taken apart, how they need to be cut up. My guest who's admitting to some guilty pleasures and something he's not so guilty about is Scott McCloud. His great new graphic novel is The Sculptor's The Treatment. I, I think, though, one of the things I, I kind of find so loving so much about um, what you do, and even in the, the reprint cover of Understanding Comics, is a sense of people floating, of being lighter than air. That's a motif that runs through a lot of your work. Where does that come from? Wow. I hadn't really thought about it, but yeah, in a way, I suppose... I'm interested in escapism as a human impulse. I think that you know one of the fundamental truths of being alive is that nobody gave a, you a choice of which world were you were born into. And I think it's our birthright to create new ones to escape to from time to time. 
And so when people accuse something of being escapism, I, I think that that's maybe a little misguided. We have a right to escape. But the best form of escape in fiction is one that allows you to re-enter the world that you live in and see it through new eyes to get some kind of perspective, to see it from a variety of viewpoints and maybe be able to triangulate the shape of that world. And so while I, th I think that you know, some work can be categorized as empty escapism because it's just trying to basically give you that, that injection of a particular drug again and again and again. I get that and that's not necessarily something worth aspiring to. I do think that – I think it's worth interrogating and evaluating that need that we have to turn off the world and make new ones. Uh, you know, we're, we're alone in our skulls our whole lives and we have that ability to alter our existence and it would be a shame not to use it from time to time. And that's – it's just one of the things that narrative fiction uh, or narrative um, – media can do. But I want to get back to this, this sort of duality that exists in the work because even starting off, your young sculptor is named David Smith and early in the book when he's talking to his uncle Harry and um, when a young waitress hears his name, she goes, oh, you're the sculptor David Smith right. and um, that confusion even. <laughs> yeah, there's, the, he, is, he is the other David Smith. There is, of course, the, the very famous American sculptor named David Smith uh, since deceased. And this guy's the other David Smith. And it's, it's that dichotomy between the two of them uh, at the center of his dilemma. But then there's a third evoking of the idea of David Smith, partially represented by yet another David Smith who actually walks into the story the, towards the end, but also this notion of all the other David Smiths. And they haunt the story. They're everywhere. This, this sense of all of the also-rans, all of the people whose names never – quite rose to the surface. You know, we have a protagonist who's trying to be remembered because he's terrified of being forgotten. Well, even that conversation, there's another David Smith that comes up. <laughs> yeah, there is another David Smith. Right, yeah, because the, the waitress has a cousin named David Smith. Yeah. So the, the, this thing is populated with David Smiths. But in a way, the David Smiths are my real protagonist. You know, even maybe more than my actual name protagonist is the presence of the, the massive number of people who struggle every day to be remembered and, and aren't, M many of whom are forgotten in their own lifetime. You know, anyone who's ever had a relative die and is going through things that they made, you know, it doesn't have to be a painting or a drawing or a sculpture. It could be something as simple as a, a tatted doily or, or a, a, a gift that they made for somebody, a pressed flower. All of these things being forgotten, left in storage facilities or plowed under in land, landfills. There's something about that too, that impulse to be – to leave something behind of value and to watch that value fade is to me – it's intensely sad but it's also something I want to reach out and, and celebrate too at the same time. Well, if, and in fact, so much of the work, uh, there's, there are so many parties <laughs> in the things there that are you do. Parties, there are a lot of yeah. parties and, and <laughs> that idea of celebration and, and – and, Taking comfort or rather seizing the moment that exists before you yeah. means a lot to you too, doesn't it? Yeah, the seizing of the now, that sort of thing. That's, that's definitely been there all along. And I don't know. Maybe it's just because of the way my, my life went. It's because I spent so much time working and I do. I, I spent huge amounts of my life at the drawing board or at the drawing tablet now working. And so, you know, I have this presence always just out, you know, just out of sight of my wife who's ready to like usher me back into the world and, and remind me you know, what's happening right now. Also, just on a practical level, she notices what's happening right now when I don't, when I'm like lost. I can barely function without her there just telling me, oh, wait, hold on. You need to go there now. Turn right. Well, we need to go there now. Uh, right here, we need to take a break and celebrate my guest, Scott McLeod, whose terrific new book is the new graphic novel, years, decades literally in the making, is The Sculptors, The Treatment. There's more to come. Stay with us. This podcast is produced by KCRW, a nonprofit public radio station based in Santa Monica. KCRW is listener supported. Help us continue to create and distribute our unique content. Go to kcrw.com slash join to donate. And thanks.
Welcome back to the world of David. It's The Treatment. I'm Elvis Mitchell. My guest is Scott McLeod, whose spectacular new graphic novel, First, is The Sculptor. And uh, one of the things that we talked about in the talk, and I wanted to get to a little bit here too, is it seemed like your propensities and your work point you towards this because one of the things I'd, I'd like pointing out to you is the way you concentrate on hands, the way you use hands for expression, and the way that so many comic artists don't. They tend to try to sort of use grimace or eyes. I mean, there are a lot of eyes in comics. Yeah. And you, you use, you're use very interested in using the hand. And the idea of having a sculptor is an ideal hero for you in that respect, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I, I've always loved hands. But this time I knew it had to be a motif. And I had to employ it in every way I could. You know, part of it is just that uh, as a reader, I get exhausted with just faces and figures, faces and figures, faces and figures. Too many artists do that. And I've been trying to tell young artists that what you choose to put in your panel is often far more interesting and effective than how well it's drawn. And that's and, an interesting thing to point out because it's almost like going back to pop the idea of you, if you play a lot of licks, that means you're a great guitarist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't always work that way. But so hands is just sort of the next step down, right? I mean, it's such a simple thing. It's just focusing on other parts of the body. It sounds like a no-brainer, and a lot of people just don't do that. They don't take advantage of these magnificent things that we have that are so expressive and right there, right in front of us. Easy to draw. They're right there. <laughs> just hold them up. If it's the wrong hand, look in a mirror. It works. So, yeah, I started working hands into this thing, and you know, it, it, it gave me so many opportunities, so many different ways to um, express intimacy or express anxiety. And it was fun also just putting Easter eggs in it, like having my, my protagonist come from Michigan was fun because of, you know, anyone from Michigan knows this is how you, you show where you are from in, in Michigan by pointing at your hand. But it's also getting back to those opposing, conflicting dualities, if you will, of the difference between David and his girl is that he's all in his head and she's, she lives her life through her heart. She's all in the world. And, you know, because of that, she, you know, she even says she's a bit of a wanderer, right? She doesn't have quite the same drive that he does. And so she's a wanderer in her career, too. But she's still experiencing things every day. And again, this is, this is straight out of, you know, my wife's life and I. I mean, she inspired the character of Meg, you know, quite a lot. And, and that's, that's one of the key things in our own life, too, is that she's, she's alive, she's present, She's paying attention, right? And that's, that's that choice that all artists have to make. How much time to spend in their heads, how much time to spend worrying about what happens after they're gone, i.e. making something that gets remembered, right? And how much time to, uh, can they spend just existing, just, just being in the moment? And I wonder why you chose to make him a sculptor, just because I found myself thinking that New York is really a sculpture garden, Manhattan as much as anything else. Yeah, There's yeah. sculpture everywhere. Well, you know what? In an early scene, I had him talking about his whole artistic philosophy, and I had him obsessed with the idea of New York as a sculpture, except a sculpture without a mind, without, without an artist, without hands, but just this thing, this thing created by money and power by some kind of anonymous force. And he wanted somehow to just pound his fist on it, to, to shape it, to, to make something real and human in the presence of all that. But it didn't, in the end, have anything to do with the fundamental story. And that, as compelling as that was, it didn't hook up to what the story I realized was ultimately about. And that was his fear of being forgotten. And that's why that, that scene changed. And it became more this, this dream that he had about all of Manhattan tilting and all of Manhattan being filled with artists and the artists all sliding off and him wanting to find an anchor because that that was what the story was about. But it took me four drafts to get to that before I knew I had to get rid of that early scene. Wow, Scott, because I, I just, I think that works so beautifully in subtextual terms that it doesn't really need to be stated. And I wonder too is, as you were doing these drafts, you realized it was better for people to sort of infer that rather than having it spelled out for them. Well, I, I hit a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of things that, what do they say? You know, you should figure out exactly what you want to say in a story and then bury it. That's exactly what I did for the most part. But there are some things, I, you know, I do, I don't know, I guess I've seen enough Disney movies to know that you need an I want song, <laughs> you know, like at some point. <laughs> you know what I mean? At some point, the character has to let you know what, the, what they're about. 
And he has to explicitly wish it as well. In, in a way, it's his nine-year-old self that explicitly makes the wish that death grants, you know, in, in, in a form that's too complicated to explain. But that's really the explicit wish. But at the same point, we have to know where the emotional wish is. What's the will that's being stymied? What is it, what is it that, that he, he wants with the force of, of his entire being? What does he want? I think at some point we have to, to clearly see that because I, I, I tend to think of stories as the life cycle of a desire. I think of them not so much as, as about a human being that harbors desire but that desire in the abstract as a protagonist. You know, just like the notion of the selfish gene, you know, reproducing itself. Because if you look, almost all stories begin with the gestation and birth of a desire. And they almost always take you to the point at which that desire is either, either fulfilled, denied, or transformed. And it's the path that desire takes that uh, determines the path the story takes. My guest, who's once again taking us back to pop, is Scott McCloud. His newest work, the terrific new book, is The Sculptor. It's The Treatment. But I, I, I want to go back to, uh, I guess, because there's the big influence of anime, which is also, for me, very much a pop-derived idiom, too. I mean, yeah. it's got and ma manga, in my case, because yeah, yeah, I'm such a comics nerd. So, so sure, of course, um, manga, yes, because that there is an eagerness, a pop eagerness in manga. Yeah. Uh, there's almost always a sense of leaning forward in manga. And there's that <laughs> sense of anticipation that exists in, in your work, too. And I wonder if that's something that was one of the things you picked up from manga, that sort of anticipation. Yeah, the yearning. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a big part of it, absolutely. Although the biggest thing I got from manga was that sense of participation on the part of the reader. That was a huge thing for me. And this was going all the way back to the 80s when I was reading Japanese, untranslated Japanese comics in Rockefeller Center, three blocks from DC Comics. Oh, that, yeah, where that, I that, that, that terrific store. Oh, yeah, amazing stuff. The whole second floor, nothing but comics. And, and you can actually read that stuff without having it translated for the most part because it's, it's so evocative in emotional terms, isn't it? Yeah, and the storytelling was so solid. You know, once you get the right to left thing, uh, you can read whole stories without understanding a word of Japanese. But what I figured out early on was that they have kind of a motif, the entire country, all these different genres, they all did one thing consistently. And that is they took the position that the reader should feel like a participant in the story. They should feel like they're in the middle of the story. If the protagonist has an emotion, you should feel that emotion. They'd use expressionistic effects to force that emotion. If the reader was moving, you shouldn't observe the motion. You should feel like you are the moving object along with them. All these, there were like 10 or 12 different techniques and they all came back to that single motif. So that was the strongest thing I got from manga and, and anime to a lesser extent. You talk about those things in, in, in your books on, on understanding what comics are and understanding where they need to go, which is a really, I, th I thought, pretty audacious thing for you to say is you communicated your, not your boredom, but your impatience for the next iteration of what comics were to be. I was impatient at the age of 14. Gosh, really? I mean, it was always about potential for me. I've always been in love with what comics could do more than what comics had done. I actually had a kind of bleak view of comics history when I was starting out. Yeah? Now it's better. I mean, because, you know, we have better comics. But I, I was never one of these guys who was like, oh, for the golden age, you know, when, <laughs> you know, like so-and-so is still drawing Wonder Woman. Screw that. I mean, yeah, there were some great comics and, you know, there are some some interesting artists, I mean, some fantastic artists, especially in the very early days, people like Windsor McKay. But man, that's, uh, compared to what's happening now in the last 10, 15 years, I mean, we're just so much better off. But yeah, it was always about potential. It's still about potential, especially when it comes to things like web comics. You know, as far as I'm concerned, we've just, we just scratched the surface. But I feel like, and I said this to you when we had our talk, that you couldn't have realize the sculptor until this point in your life. But I also feel Absolutely, like part of it, yeah. too, comes from that unspoken, if you will, or probably pretty vociferously spoken, need to see comics move into the next stage. And that precipitated your involvement and in making that happen to some extent, too, didn't it? Well, yeah. When I started working on making comics, is because I, I become, this was back in 2006, I become really fascinated with just the challenge of creating super readable comics. You know, it has, it's such a simple thing, but I felt like we needed almost a kind of a new mainstream. I mean, like something that, that would just just bare bones, really strong storytelling, something that compels you to turn the pages and keep turning them. 
until the story is done, something that draws you in. And I felt like the all ages people, you know, artists like Raina Telgemeier, were really covering their base, that base really well, and they were bringing a whole army of readers in. And so, in a lot of ways, this book was partially just about pure readability. I was just fascinated with the technology of storytelling, creating a story that that would draw the reader in to such an extent they wouldn't even notice what panel transitions I was using or why I chose a bleed on this page or whatever. They just forget about that stuff and and be in the world of the story. Because that's a formal challenge. That's that's an interesting challenge. You know, that directors and screenwriters and and and, and playwrights and novelists have have grappled with for centuries. It's just what are the components of creating an intuitive waking dream? Um, you know, that's fascinating stuff. But there's a thing that comes from manga, too, that I thought you, you really seized and not something you mentioned much in other books, is that sense of melodrama, uh, that sense of outsized emotion. Right. And, yeah, yeah, that's an important thing, though, because there's a danger there. Okay. You know, even I know that. Even me, my my big, weepy, sentimental self, even I see the danger of unearned emotion. That's the thing I worry about. And I see it. I see it in some TV shows that I'm not going to name. I, I see it, you know, I see it in anime and I see it in manga. It's just like go straight for it. You know, go to the weeping. Go, go from the weeping to the ecstasy, right? Unearned. And so, I, yes, I want to reach those heights. Yes, I want to take the reader to the outer limits of certain emotions. But I want to feel like I, I did my homework and I played fair and I earned them. And no shortcuts. No shortcuts. And that's one of the reasons it's 500 pages. Because it is, it is all earned. And even though the chapter stops are really about sort of letting us know where we are in terms of time, there are kind of chapter stops, sort of climactic points in, yeah. in each section yeah. that you didn't break up into more chapters. And I thought, too, part of that was you got to this point, you realized you don't have to do that. There are certain, as you're saying, convention of comics, of graphic novels, whatever terminology we want to use here, that you just could dispense with and trust the reader to go along with them. And it was going back to faith, faith that you could do this and compel the reader to go along with this all the way through to the end of the sculpture. Yeah. Well, all I had to do was make sure that I was compelled as a reader. That was my first test. Well, then, of course, I gave it to my friends and they told me if I was screwing up. But And, and that's the other thing I find in your work, too, that I get it's not so much a sense from you. I don't want to use the word impatience, but just this need to kind of move forward. You know, yeah. I mean, you well, there is impatience. No, there's definitely impatience. Okay, it takes forever. I mean, like you know, I had all these goals for web comics early on that I you know cooked up in 1996, and I thought, well, it'll take a few years. It'll take 1999. We're still waiting. It's 2015. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm impatient. I've always been impatient. Well, we don't have to wait anymore because your terrific new book, The Sculptors. I can't. I can't compel people to or, or persuade people strongly enough, and also to find Zot, which is you said uh, HarperCollins collected the black and white series yeah. of Zot. Really pretty cover that, that they helped put together for that. Please get that. You, you will love these books as much as I do. I can't thank you enough, Scott. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you, Elvis. My pleasure. My guest is Scott McLeod. His terrific new book is The Sculptor. A recording engineer who also makes the show is Melissa Morton. It's edited and produced by Jenny Rattler. I'm going to go read some comics. It's the treatment. catch up on past episodes with the treatment, go to kcrw.com or listen on your smartphone with KCRW's mobile apps or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or if you listen to podcasts. The treatment is produced and distributed by KCRW Santa Monica. That don't be-